my nature, not, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case, open and shut No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut Today we'll go bird watching, tomorrow we'll catch toads The next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut That's why I'm a nature nut Well, I'm a nature nut, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case, open and shut No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut Hello there, nature nuts. How you doing? Listen, I've got a really neat idea for today's show, so why don't you come on over here and I'll let you in on the plan. The theme today is do-it-yourself eco-tours, not the kind of eco-tours where you pay a bunch of money and wind up with people you don't know. I'm talking about the kind of eco-tours where you just pick a neat place on the map, uh, invite a bunch of your friends, Nobody pays anybody anything, and you just do it for the fun of it. So that's what we've done here, and when I say we, I mean my friend Chris Fisher and I have invited a whole bunch of our friends. We sent out an email a couple weeks ago, and we are expecting any minute now. Let's see, who do we send it to? A bunch of amateur naturalists. Uh, my friend Physics Dave. You always need a physicist on an expedition of any sort. A couple of university professors. Some university students. Professional biologists like Robert B. Hughes. He should be here. Who else? I mean, anybody. You know, friends, grandchildren. It's all kind of an open thing. And, let's see, what else do I need? I need a jacket. Oh, yeah. And, uh... You like this new office of mine? Well, there. It's not complete without the lamp. <laughs> there we go. Look at the wall. Wow. Isn't this fine? Check that out. Yeah. You know what we got here. What? We have a den of prairie rattlesnakes. What's oh. their Latin name? Well, that'd be uh, Crotalus viridis viridis. No way. Yeah. Are we safe here? We are safe because we're professionals. <laughs> uh, although, you know, sometimes while you're watching a group of rattlesnakes like this, the other ones will sneak up from other directions. So, you know, glance around every once in a while. <laughs> hey, you never know. Is this the first time you guys have seen them, Kevin oh, and Chris? Yeah. Yep. They're yeah. beautiful. So many. It's nice, that, uh, you know, when you look for something for a long time and then when you first see it, you see 20, 30 at a time. Yeah, that's great. This, by the way, is Lisa Tackett's professional snake biologist. She works with uh, snake overwintering dens and uh, you'd say this is a pretty typical situation, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, they're uh, just denning up for the winter time here at the end of August. The, uh, the young are what, about a month old now? Uh, yeah, they uh, usually have live young, uh, mid to late July, so these ones would be about one month old. I like them. They're, they're, uh, they've got a nice dark pattern compared to the adults. And, uh, yeah, and they don't have any uh, rattle on the tail. When they shed their skin, they add another segment to the rattle. Yes, each, exactly. Each, yeah. so they, and then they, they break off occasionally. Yeah, so they may uh, shed a couple of times a year, so that may not necessarily indicate how old they are. It just tells you how many times they've shed, minus the number of times they've busted things off. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. I guess they're not entirely uh, harmless though, but they are cute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, the, the young ones are more dangerous than the adults because they're not able to control how much venom they inject when they bite. Mm -hmm. So, because of that, you have to be very careful around the young ones. And so you they'll, give you the, them. they'll give you the full dose even if you don't need exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. Boy, how much more lucky could you get? By the way, if you make one of these trips yourself, put it together, make sure to invite a snake biologist as well as a physicist. <laughs> then you'll have all the bases covered. Rattlesnake out on the highway Hugs the warm tar to stay hot All night out sniffing for kangaroo rats 
You might think it's fun, but it's not. Prairie rattlesnakes often hibernate peacefully alongside bull snakes as well as wandering garter snakes. Okay, well now it's time to check out the butterflies and the dragonflies around here. I just found out from my friends John and Christine that they have a little game that they play that when you find an interesting dragonfly, like a variegated meadowhawk, you place it on the other person's nose and you can't flick it off. You have to wait until it's ready to go, at which point it will fly away of its own free will. So uh, I'd hate to lose you know, my standing with those folks, so I'm just gonna play along here. It's an intensely itchy thing to do if you ever try it yourself. But let me tell you about the, uh, the butterflies here. We've been doing really well. Some of us have been looking for them in uh, binoculars. We've also been catching them and releasing them. And, uh, oh, neat, neat butterflies here. A beautiful, fresh, gorgeous Milbert's tortoise shell. That was the highlight for me. Things like uh, the, the variegated fertility, a very tropical sort of a butterfly, some tiny little Melissa blues, a an exquisite purplish copper, which is of course orange in color and not purplish at all, and uh, oh yeah, all sorts of interesting things, including, and this is one that really I think is a neat story, our friend Rob Hughes, earlier this year, he thought he'd found some woodland skippers up at Vigreville, which is a town quite a bit north of here. Other butterfly people told him, no, no, you're wrong, you know, pff, those aren't woodland skippers, those are long dash skippers. So Rob felt kind of, uh, kind of bad about that. But today he redeemed himself, he found a woodland skipper. It turned out to be not only a woodland skipper, but the most northern woodland skipper ever recorded in this part of the world. That is a historic and beautiful butterfly moment. So we're doing well, we're having fun, and it's about time for this dragonfly to go somewhere else. I wonder if it's, ha, there, that wasn't cheating. It's perfectly legitimate. Okay, I'm gonna go jo I'm gonna join my buddies here, excuse me. So what do you do after dark on an expedition like this? Well, a bunch of us decided to grab our flashlights and go visit a sandy area to look for Ord's kangaroo rats. This small, very tame rodent is a rarity here, and our intrepid crew was delighted to come upon one after only a few minutes of searching. Yeah, we just drove along until we saw him, and then uh, Sandy jumped out with the uh, butterfly net, and I kept the light on him, and we, we got him. So we just wanted to detain him for just long enough for everybody to see him. And then we'll let him back out and... Isn't that a gorgeous thing? He is. I mean, it looks a lot like a gerbil. It's everything that thing has is just completely adapted to arid situations. Never drinks any water. Eats completely seeds. Their metabolism can get enough water from that. And I, my understanding is about uh, nine-tenths of them die over the winter. That's right. They don't get through hibernation. Well, so. the young ones, the young ones, the first year ones. Yeah, yeah. So this one, that's, I don't know, I don't think this is an adult myself. Well, it's a lot larger than the ones we saw, and it's, it's yeah. posing, it's sitting more adult-like. Yeah. And it's so clean. Look at all the fur is just completely clean and beautiful. That's my understanding. They groom themselves quite a bit. They have cheek pouches where they store seeds in. And they can invert them and groom them with their little That's claws and stuff. Well, so then if everybody has seen this one, and they've found one out there, so we can let this one go. Yeah, just let, let it come out on its own side. That's great. You know, one of the neat things about planning a trip like this, you really never know how it's going to all shake out as far as personalities and so on, who'd have thunk that inviting a physicist to a naturalist trip would be the greatest thing we ever did. This is our friend Dave Laurie, Physics Dave we call him, Dr. Laurie, he just got his PhD in physics. I mean, he still likes nature a great deal, but he's a physicist at heart. He's probably going to have his own TV show someday. So uh, watch out, Bill Nye the Science Guy. This is Physics Dave. Okay, so everybody's been calling me Physics Dave. Well, I, that's true. That's what I've been working on. I have my doctorate in physics now. And what I was working on to get that is materials like this. 
called a superconductor. And actually at room temperature, or air temperature right now, it's just sort of a black disc, kind of boring, doesn't have any unusual properties. But if we make it really cold, then we can see the superconducting properties. And one of the properties of them is that it will not let a magnetic field into the interior of the material. And in order to show that, I have some little tiny, really strong magnets that you can see stick to my steel knife. So if we put this on the superconductor and I make it really cold, we should see something unusual. In order to make it really cold, I have something called liquid nitrogen, which is the same stuff as what you're breathing right now, except that this stuff is about minus 200 degrees Celsius. So you have to be careful. So we'll pour some in. And let it cool down. And you can see right now it's boiling away like mad. And as it gets cool, it will go into the superconducting state. And in the superconducting state, it has very unusual magnetic properties. Which, because we have a magnet on top of it, will probably do something very unusual. Oh. What happened? What's it doing? It's floating. Yeah. In the air? In the air, yeah. Look at this. In the air from the magnetic field. Yeah. First, first. It's the magnetic field that's holding it up. Yep. Want to try? Now right. you take it off. Yeah. Boom. And I'll use the tweezers to put it back on. Cool. So that's what I spent six years of my life studying. And we still don't completely know why these things work. The prairies of western Canada lie within the northern limit of the Great Plains natural region, which covers much of the north and central United States. Well, this is rapidly becoming one of our favorite uh, spots. It's a spring fed salty wetland way out in the middle of nothing in the grasslands. It's just wonderful. There are people here looking for birds, people looking for uh, dragonflies and damselflies. And this is my friend Chris Fisher, who, uh, well, what we organized this trip together. And that's right. We wrote a book together. We've taught together at the university. And he is also uh, a leopard frog biologist and has worked on leopard frog situations. That's so right. You've got one right here? Just happened to have one here and we can see why it's called a leopard frog. It's got big black spots but it's on a green body which is a little bit different from leopards. And uh, the reason that we're here is this is one of the great spots for leopard frogs in this part of the, um, the country. Uh, about 20 years ago they declined dramatically and um, surprisingly no one was really looking at them at that point in time. I remember that, they just basically disappeared. From so many yeah. places, basically west of Manitoba, Wisconsin. They've recolonized a lot of those areas but uh, out here really at the western fringe of their range uh, they're just really in some of these isolated areas like this spring right here. Nothing can come in, nothing can come out. So what we're starting to do now is we're um, looking at reintroducing them to other areas upstream so they can naturally disperse. So we're using these frogs as uh, the source as the source for new ones to, uh, to reintroduce elsewhere. Yeah, into their historic ranges in uh, this part of the world. And did you hear that just behind me? I heard it. Boreal chorus frog. So at some point, all the frogs in this part of the world will can trace their ancestry back to the 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 difficult the legacy. times, the legacy, the the uh, the isolated Shangri-La of leopard frogs. That's right. Ho ho! We're doing good on this trip. Here's the story. Last night, I'm falling asleep in my tent. The other folks, some of the other folks, those late night folks, are sitting around the campfire, and I hear the word Solvugid. I thought to myself, hmm, and then I fell back asleep, and in the morning, sure enough, they had a sulfugid in a small terrarium. Now a sulfugid, or sulfugid, they have many names, they're also called wind scorpions and sun spiders and camel spiders, they're wonderful things, they're related to other arachnids, but they're not the same as spiders or scorpions, they're their own little weird group, 
and they live in dry places throughout uh, the warmer parts of the world. These are the most northern Salpugids in the world. Uh, we've seen the most northern rattlesnakes, the most northern kangaroo rats, and now we're looking at the most northern Salpugids, a very desert creature. This one is, is using its wonderful weird jaws to move rocks and dig itself a little burrow. The thing I like about them is that their jaws work up and down like a, like a little mammal not side to side like most bugs. And that's because they're really not jaws, they're the same structure as the claws of scorpions. Very bizarre, that's a Salpugid. <laughs> oh. When we got home, a Salpugid specialist told me that the proper term is now Solifuge, and that the one we found is probably a species new to science. Hi, right, Dave. Hey. Okay, well, here's the scoop. This is, of course, Physics Dave. And this is one whopping big caterpillar. It's the caterpillar of the big poplar sphinx moth. And I was just saying to Dave moments ago, Dave, I think this is probably the heaviest insect in this part of the world. So, uh, in order to determine that, since we forgot our, you know, scientific microgram balance. Dave has constructed this balance from things that he apparently normally carries with him and we are going to, uh, well, we're going to balance the balance and then, well, yep, yeah. So, do you want to wrangle the caterpillar or do you want to do the no, money? I'll do the money. Okay, well, I'll do the caterpillar. Yeah. Make sure he stays in the cup. Yeah. Don't poop. If you poop, you weigh less. Okay, here we go. Look at that. That's a big caterpillar. Okay. Okay. There we go. Oh, he's heavy. One, two, stay in. Ah! Oh! Come back. Get in there, get in there. We'll let you go pupate as soon as this is over, okay? When they pupate, they weigh less. That's yeah. why we gotta do it right so now. So we got two pennies. Three, four, five, six. Oh. Oh, six is, is too heavy. Maybe six is too heavy? Okay, try a dime. Lock my head a bit here. Hmm. Let's try two dimes. Alright, see that's about it. Oh, that's nice. That's like, okay. How much how much okay. does he or she weigh? We've got 24 cents. Two dimes and four pennies. 24 cents Canadian, that's about a nickel American. Science in action. Isn't that beautiful? The caterpillar weighed in at 14.3 grams, five times the mass of our smallest bird, the calliope hummingbird. <coughs> Don't let your wieners fall in the fire. May your marshmallows not burst into flame. May all mosquitoes turn vegetarian And may your tent keep you dry if it should rain Hey, that's bizarre, right? Oh, yeah. That's an old John Denver song. Watch the sparks, watch the sparks. Hey, Sue, go get the tuba. Tuba? Yeah, yeah. Sue. Yeah. Sitting around the campfire playing Hoping that the rain won't be raining on us I got a flashlight I trust to light up when it's spooky and black. I don't fear no attack. In the morning, tracks that we track might lead back to a snack pack. I'm ready for the day when the morning sun comes up. Fix most anything with my Swiss Army knife. Rolling up my sleeping bag, enjoying my second cup. Checking out these great outdoors. Man, that's the life. These great outdoors. How many of them can you count? We 
found some strange evidence. So if there's dead flatulence in your tents, better open a vent, gents. Well, there's weirdness in the night, but don't let it get you get up tight. There's really no cause for alarm. Besides, when the day is done, it's fun to sing some silly song. Hey, everybody, come on, sing along. Don't let your wieners fall in the fire. May your marshmallows not burst into flames. May your mosquitoes turn vegetarian. And may your tent keep you dry if it should rain. Don't let your wieners fall in the fire. May your marshmallows not burst into flames. May all those mosquitoes turn vegetarian. And may your tent keep you dry if it should. starts to warm up, what happens when you heat things up? <laughs> it's pulling back up again. <laughs> See, it's kind of still the rubber's a bit frozen, so it's kind of all that well. That's neat. In total, our group found and identified more than 215 species of insects, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. Ah, the joys of summer camping. Your home is a bag in a tent. It's good to go searching for birds and for beasts in that wondrous place where the butterflies went. When was the last time you stalked with a net or admired a fluttering white? Oh, look, there's a creature as weird as a dream and another at home in the dark prairie night. While searching for oddness in nature, one's childhood is often regained. There's not much that sunshine and mud and bare feet can't do to make friendship a thing unexplained. So wander at will neath that big, big, big prairie sky, till back to the camp we come hungrily by, and the fire is warm as the sun becomes shy till we sleep with no streetlights in sight. Well, I guess every great adventure has to end. We like to end ours here at the Vortec. We don't know what the Vortec is. It could just be a piece of equipment. On the other hand, it does have a sort of an alien buzz to it. It might be an intelligent being in its own right. It might have great powers. I'm kind of wishing we didn't have to drive all the way home, about a six hour drive. If only the Vortec could form some sort of mental link with Physics Dave and figure out a way to transport us out of here. Yeah, okay, well that worked. Vortec, as I've always suspected, has a sense of humor. I'm the one who has to drive home. Anyway, may you have great adventures of your own, and may you find your own Vortec, and if you get a chance, drop me a line, tell me all about it. So until next time, I'm a nature nut, and I hope you are too. See you again. Listen to it purring back there. It's very pleased with itself, you can tell. time each and every week uncensored and uncut no doubt about it i'm a nature nut <laughs>